for the debt that we owe to Huntsfield for the kind of person Harold Wilson became. His upbringing and education was absolutely critical uh, to him. And some of you may know that every Saturday when there was a football match, his mother used to give him a shilling. Half of that went to get into the match, half of it went for a pie and a tram to get to the match. And he used to write that he had to be there very early to get into the match, such was the demand. Uh, uh, and now again, of course, because Huddersfield's in the Premier League, which I congratulate you for. <laughs> uh, an amazing uh, achievement to, to be in the Premier League and to, to do that. But Harold was a great uh, footballer supporter. And you know, he went to see Brezhnev, the president of, of Russia. And for some reason, he started to show the one thing that he had in his wallet. And he pulled it out, and it was a photograph of the Huddersfield FC football team who had won the 1926 League Championship, and he'd been carrying that around for 40 years in, in his wallet, handed it to Brezhnev to show it. Brezhnev didn't quite get the message about what it was all about, and so Brezhnev autographed the photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and for the next, and Robin gave him photos, and for the next year, he wandered around with the photograph, signed by Brezhnev, a recognition, I think, again, of the international importance of that. <laughs> And, and Harold, of course, was a great devotee of football, and I, too, am a devotee of football. And everybody says to you, if you're a politician and you say you're a football supporter, you're just making it up. And, and of course, some politicians did make it up. I, I actually, I'm a shareholder in the least successful football club in uh, Scotland at the moment, Braith Rovers, but I was real town. And Harold was a genuine uh, supporter uh, and carried around the memories of what uh, happened uh, to, to Huddersfield and its successes. Uh, as well as uh, all the different uh, uh, trials and tribulations of football. And of course, uh, he used to talk in football terms, and he said when he first became Prime Minister, uh, he was the, the goalkeeper, he, he was the, the left winger, uh, he was the striker or the centre forward, he was taking all the penalties. And then when he became Prime Minister for the second time, he said, I'm taking a completely different uh, view. He said, if people understood what a sweeper was, that's what I'm trying to be. You know? <laughs> uh, the the centre-half, it was the defensive centre-half. And, and when he lost the election in 1970, he called it relegation. <laughs> <laughs> he, thought, he, thought, he thought in 1966, funnily enough, that uh, uh, he, after winning the election, of course, the, the World Cup is won. He wanted to be on television commentating on the World Cup. The BBC, I don't know why, they refused to accept it. But, <laughs> there, there it is. But in 1970, you might argue, that one of the reasons that Labour uh, didn't do as well in the election was the national mood was down uh, after being eliminated from, from the World Cup. And Harold had a view on this, they should not have taken off Bobby Charlton, otherwise they would have gone back. <laughs> so Huddersfield was incredibly important and education important. And what he learned, because he spent most of his schooling in Huddersfield, uh, what he learned in Huddersfield uh, led him to believe in the importance that everybody should have opportunities in education. And of course, at dawn at 21, working as a wartime statistician at 23, all the academic honors that anybody could expect, Harold it, it, it enjoyed. But he wanted everybody who had missed the chance of going to university or who was deterred from going to university by money or for any other reasons to have that chance. And hence, what I think uh, was the most brilliant idea for its time and recognized to be one of the greatest achievements to which he is, with which he is associated as the leader of it, the Open University, and of course we were very lucky that Robert was a professor of mathematics at the Open University for many years, continuing the family tradition as his mother did of a great interest in the success of the Open University. But even as Prime Minister, to create the Open University it was very difficult. Harold had gone to America and he'd seen, I think Robert was there, he'd seen the editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica who was running a radio station, University of the Air, and he could see that this could be television as well as uh, radio. He'd seen in Russia that 60% of the engineers uh, were trained on radio courses, correspondence courses, followed by a full-time year, but they were, most of their education was through uh, non-formal methods. Hence the idea of the Open University, which he launched uh, just at the time that he was uh, preparing for the 1964 general election. Uh, he launched it with his speech about the white, remember that speech that some people have quoted very, very often, the white heat of technology, we're going to clear out the deadwood from the boardrooms. That's a pretty good uh, phrase he used about <laughs> British industry. And we're going to have the white heat of the technological. And around that came this idea of the Open University. But to get it through, and this is what government, I'm afraid, is about, he had to face the opposition of many in the civil service. He had to face the opposition of many people who were ministers in his own government. 
who had been at Oxford and Cambridge like uh, Harold had been, but did not see the wisdom of what they thought was dumbing down uh, by creating an open university. So Harold insisted that the standards of the open university had to be the same as the standards of any other university. I actually was one of the first uh, part-time tutors at the Open University, and I tell you uh, that the uh, standard of the courses was higher, in my view, than most uh, universities, and they insisted on the quality uh, that attracted students to take a second chance or to take a further degree at the Open University, uh, and he won through against the opposition. Lloyd Jenkins was Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he could always get his way with Harold by saying, look, we've got to make cuts, he said, um, the Open University is the first one, and then he could get his way, of course, because Harold was determined to protect the Open University, and that's how it was saved. 1970, the Conservatives come in. i just seen, because one of my uh, uh, people who works with me showed me this memo. The, one of the first things they did, this memo, to actually destroy the Open University, close it down, and the memo said, we're going to cut it, there's no money for it, we're just going to extending cuts, we've got to send a message, we've got to be closed down. Uh, and to her credit, funnily enough, Margaret Thatcher realized with 50,000 people already signed up to the Open University, she had arrived on her hands if she tried to cancel it. And so the Open University went ahead, uh, 50,000 students initially, then up to 100,000 uh, by the, the late 1980s, 200,000 by 2000, 210,000 when we were in government 2010. Now what has happened? It has been hard. It is down to just over 100,000 now. And that is a tragedy that we must all want to do something about. This great achievement, breakthroughs in learning, technology applied to the business of university education, highly successful, and actually uh, now half in size uh, since 2010, more than half in size, and its future, in my view, has got to be defended. Because what the Open University said about Harold Wilson and said about what our aims are important is that everybody should have the chance to realize the potential at any time in their life and any course of uh, study. And we need to, to think of education as bridging the gap between what people are and what they have it in themselves to become. Now, I want to talk in the minutes that I have about two aspects of Harold's life and to draw what I think are the conclusions that we must consider for our generation. I want to say something about his internationalism, and I want to say something about his uh, purpose and politics <coughs> when it came to social justice and economic uh, progress. Now, if you look at the international uh, context, a few prime ministers have had to deal with bigger issues than he had to deal with. He had to deal with the uh, Rhodesian uh, rebellion and the <coughs> sanctions, and of course the fact that the United Nations, even when they put sanctions down, was suspicious, that we were allowing sanctions to be, to be avoided. He had to deal with Vietnam, and he had to deal with American pressure all the time uh, for us to support uh, the Vietnam War, which he uh, resisted. Uh, and of course, he had to deal with the failure of the previous Conservative government to do much about international aid, despite the fact that they believed in the Commonwealth, massive amount of poverty in that part of the world. And so Harold led the way as someone who had helped form war and want. He, helped the, uh, the way, uh, he led the way in creating uh, an international aid uh, department uh, and making sure that international aid was raised and was on, 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 on the agenda. So his record in foreign affairs is as an internationalist, as someone who wanted to see uh, the world improve through cooperation uh, and as someone who was not prepared to go blindly into uh, action in support of America when he thought it was uh, wrong. Uh, it, it coincided, of course, with the economic crisis, with the problems that the Labour government faced after 1964, the strength of the pound, uh, the problems of uh, our east of Suez uh, role and the cost of that, uh, the problems, obviously, of an economy that was not as productive as it should be, uh, still to respond to the national plan of 1965, and all these things were huge difficulties. But he stood firm and said that if America uh, it was active in Vietnam. They could not expect Britain to follow. Lyndon Johnson said, just send us an army bagpiper. That would be enough to show a British presence. And he said, no, even to that. Uh, and of course, in 66, he criticized the American action. And the relations with America were always very strained uh, as, as a result. But he stood out on principle for that internationalism that I think we need to respect him for. But of course, Europe, and I'm not going to say as much about it as I've said earlier today, was an issue. You know, Harold then had a group of ministers that were uh, 
uh, so uh, varied in talent and so uh, uh, individualistic in their, in their own right. Uh, he, used, he used to say uh, that uh, if he bore grudges, uh, he'd have nobody in his cabinet. <laughs> and he used to say to people about his rivals, he said, I buried the hatchet, but I know where it is. I'll bring it up any time. But of course, his greatest uh, problem uh, was a namesake of mine, uh, George Brown, not Gordon Brown. I often get confused with him, and I have no relative. And you'll see from the story I'm about to tell that I couldn't be a relative. Uh, George, George Brown was both his rival and his deputy. Uh, he became foreign secretary after being at the Department of uh, Economic Affairs. And Harold decided that we would apply for membership of the European Union. So he sent George Brown around Europe uh, to uh, get support for the endeavor to join the European Union. And of course, George had a habit uh, of uh, uh, a few drinks before he had a meeting, a few drinks during the meeting, and many more drinks after the meeting. He goes to Paris on behalf of Harold in 1967, and he makes the mistake of calling the austere president of France, Charles de Gaulle, a Charlie. <laughs> it didn't go down well. Then he went to Brussels. This is absolutely true. He went to Brussels. Uh, and he got into an argument after a few drinks about how the Belgian soldiers had done nothing for the war effort because they'd all been in brothels and bars. <laughs> During the war, he left Brussels. <laughs> then he goes to Vienna, and he arrives in Vienna, and there's this huge diplomatic reception organized for him uh, in Vienna Town Hall. Uh, and George Brown is, has had a few drinks, obviously. He doesn't quite realize what's, what's, what, what's going on. And the music starts. And he thinks, well, this is, this is an official uh, sort of uh, ceremony dance. And he, he looks at a figure in crimson across and says, well, I've got to beat the dancing. So he walks across and says, this person, when you dance, he said, he said, first of all, you're drunk. <laughs> the reply was, uh, sec secondly, this is not a waltz. This is the national anthem. It <laughs> be standing to attention. And thirdly, I'm the Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, much, so much for uh, our outreach to Europe. <laughs> so much for winning the support of the Europeans at that time. But I tell you this, and I'm not going to labor this point, and uh, I'll come back to questions of people. <coughs> this was most difficult. Persuading Labour to join uh, and want to join the European Union, to be rebuffed by the French in the first instance, and to be turned back. And then to try again uh, uh, to do so. But at that point, to find that the party had moved against membership of the European Union, uh, what was called the common market at, at the time. And the most difficult act of navigating policy, and I think uh, we forget sometimes how difficult it is for leaders to manage uh, parties when they are such broad churches of people and ideologies and different interests and views. And I say this because I think it's got relevance to the failure of the Conservative government at the moment, that Harold managed to maintain a position that Labour was never officially against the European Union under his leadership and made it possible for us to win the referendum in 1975 when he was the Prime Minister and who had called it. And if Labour had come out totally against the common market on principle, uh, certainly he objected to the terms and he renegotiated them. And of course, when people criticize him on that, let's just remember that some of the terms that he was criticizing was the budget cost of being part of the European Union, where Mrs. Thatcher made a reputation for standing up to Europe on exactly the issue that Harold had raised. But he kept Labour in the game and did not allow Labour to become a party that was so totally hostile to the European Union uh, that it led to disaster. Now we have a situation where in the other party, uh, we've allowed uh, extremists on the, uh, on the right of that party uh, who believe that, uh, that Brexit is the only answer to take control of the public debate. And they are, these are the backseat drivers uh, that are making it impossible for the national interest to be the issue that decides whether we are members of the European Union or how we negotiate, uh, because it's their ideological considerations that are driving the debate. Now, we can have an argument or debate about this in question time, but the one thing I say is, we should remember in the art of party management and holding the show together and making it possible for Britain to stay in the European Union after the divisions that were expressed by leading people within the Labour Party, Harold Wilson deserves credit for keeping uh, Labour as a European party, which it now is again uh, and able uh, to put the, the fight. Now, some people here may be for Brexit and some people may not be, but the important thing to recognize is that parties move 
in different ways to extremes, one generation and other extremes and other generations, and there is an art of party management to making it possible for your party to take a reasoned view, an objective view of the circumstances. Domestically, of course, Harold Wilson should be remembered for something else. His concern, not just about economic progress, but about <coughs> social justice. When, when you actually look at the figures for poverty, and this is also relevant to the present day, when Labour came into power in 1964, 40%, 40 of pensioners were estimated to be in poverty. Now, a smaller proportion, obviously, because the pensioner population has been, has, has been rising, a smaller number, but a high proportion. When Labour left power in uh, 1979, so after the coup government, that was down to 25%. But the figures went up under the Conservatives, down under Labour, and then up again under the Conservatives to 1997, when the figures for pensioners in poverty were about 33%. Uh, and fortunately, by the pension credit and by the changes we made, uh, the numbers of percentage of pensions in poverty came down to around 10% under Labour. So 40% when Harold took power, down under Labour and his government, then up again and then down again. Uh, and it just shows that a commitment to social justice uh, it is something that has got to be uh, delivered in practice by making difficult decisions about the rise of the pension, about the measures you take for pensioners who are in poverty, like the pension credit. And child poverty, when Labour came into power in 64, 15% uh, of children were uh, estimated to be in, in poverty. Harold brought the figure down between 64 and 70, 13%, up again under the Conservatives, and then down again under Harold's administration, under Jim Carrigan, despite the fact that we had a massive economic crisis at the time, but again, when we came into power, the figure had gone up from 15% to 30% and above 30% for children in poverty in 1997. And this does show the difference that our policies of social justice made. We then halved child poverty, but I tell you this, and this is something I want to just come back to at the end, child poverty is rising again. There are 3 million children in poverty in 2015. The figure now in 2018 is 4.2 million. The figure that people estimate because benefits are frozen, child benefit in particular frozen, is going to be more than 5 million in 2022. Now that is the biggest figure in the post-war years for the numbers of children in poverty. In this generation, in this decade, the biggest figure, bigger than under Mrs. Thatcher, bigger than under uh, John Major's Conservative government, bigger than we've seen for 50 years, the biggest figure of children in poverty. And it does show that there is a difference in approaches that can uh, dictate what the poverty figures uh, are. Now, if you look at the record of the Labour government under Howe, one thing that has always struck me is how McMillan got praise as a Conservative Prime Minister for building 300,000 houses a year. Howard Wilson managed in 1968 to build 425,000 houses. One of the great mistakes that we made as a Labour government was not to build enough houses, but to spend our money repairing existing houses, and therefore the numbers of houses that were built uh, it, it, it is, is low, uh, and that is that, in my view, and I can admit this freely, is, is a mistake that was made. But we put huge amounts of resources into modernisation of older properties to make sure that the existing stock of housing was uh, was good enough, but at the expense of building houses. But under Howard Wilson's government, three million houses were actually built. And this is a, an amazing record. But I just want you to look at what is happening to our social fabric. So under Wilson, we have a commitment to social justice. Poverty comes down. Homelessness is, is, is reduced. We also have a commitment to building a more tolerant society in our country. I think we've got to remember that the 1960s were an era where people talked about the cozy establishment and the, the smoke-filled rooms and the, and the, 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 the almost Victorian uh, morality and by the 1970s, people had recognized that Britain had changed, and the person who presided over these changes, uh, the um, race relations legislation, the abolition of the death penalty, uh, the uh, legalization of uh, homosexuality, uh, the legalization of abortion, uh, these are controversial issues, but these uh, changes that brought about greater personal freedom and the greater rights of individuals to make their own decisions these all happened under Harold Wilson's uh, government. And there were private members' bills, or there were um, uh, 
put forward by people like Roy Jenkins, who played a very important role in this, but it couldn't have happened if the Prime Minister had not been prepared to understand that with the change of society, uh, we needed a more tolerant approach uh, to the way we governed ourselves and to the laws of this country, and they were brought forward. But what happens to the social fabric is what I want to finish up. You know, in the 1970s, uh, uh, there were huge debates about economic policy and about the relevance to social justice. And in the 1970s and 80s, we had the rise of the neoliberal movement, Hayek, and all these uh, neoliberal philosophers which have dominated economic thinking, really, for the last uh, 30 years, and tragically so. And J.K. Galbraith was the great economist of the time who stood out against this neoliberal trend. And he used to tell me this story uh, when I met him when he came to London about speaking at the 50th anniversary of the Austrian Republic. And he'd been invited to speak uh, to this Vienna Town Hall thing again, the Vienna Town Hall meeting. And all the famous economists who were Austrians uh, were there uh, to, for his lecture to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Austrian Republic. You had von Hayek, the great right-wing economist, Hugh Bronner, you had Meisen, all these people. And they were all sitting in the front row as Galbraith, the radical progressive economist, gave his lecture. And he started off his lecture by saying it was a great pleasure to be in the Town Hall to celebrate the, the anniversary of the Austrian Republic. But he wanted to give particular thanks, and he singled them out to Professor von Hayek and to all these other economists, he said. Because if they had not left Austria and gone to America in 1945, Austria could never have enjoyed the economic progress and social justice that it had. And that was the huge debate in economic policy. The neoliberals who say, forget about social justice. And people like Bill Brave and uh, Harold Wilson and uh, his generation who said that the key to social justice and the key to a better society is to marry the demands of economic efficiency uh, with a commitment uh, to fairness and equality uh, for all. And you know, uh, when, uh, when Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, and uh, again, this was the time of the 1980s, Olive Palmy was the Prime Minister of Sweden. He was, he was an egalitarian, so he was the progressive social democrat, and he was up against Reagan, of course, the, uh, the new liberal. And he asked to meet Reagan uh, because of his interest in equality and international development. Reagan kept refusing to meet uh, Palmy the Swedish Prime Minister, because he didn't he really want to meet him. And then eventually, before um, uh, Reagan left office, he finally agreed to meet the Swedish Prime Minister. And so Palmy, as Prime Minister, was about to come into the office. Reagan, as usual, was looking at his notes, consulting his officials to see what was actually going on. <laughs> and, and he said to his officials, uh, Palmy, this guy, he said, isn't he a communist? <laughs> and, and his, and his uh, officials said, no, Mr. President, he's an anti-communist. And Reagan said, well, I don't care what kind of communist he is. <laughs> Reagan invites Palme, Palme comes in, he, said, he, says to, he says to Palme, are you the man who wants to abolish the rich? And Palme says, no, I'm the man who wants to abolish the poor. I want every person to have the right to the right But look at what's happened in these last few years, and then think what we can do about it. The social contract that existed in our societies right across the West, uh, particularly in Europe since 1945, was built on four foundations. The first was that wages and work would earn people a decent income and keep them out of poverty. The second was there was a ladder of opportunity through which I and uh, uh, Harold Wilson and others and many of you managed to climb uh, because if you worked hard, you were guaranteed that you would have some uh, chance of doing, doing well. But there was a ladder of opportunity. The third one was that, yes, there was top pay in your society, but if it was justified, it had to be justified on the basis of merit or effort or contribution to the community. And the fourth was there was a national minimum below which nobody should ever fall. National minimum both in the provision of public services and in the provision of individuals having decent uh, incomes that took them free of poverty. Now, none of these principles of what you might call uh, building blocks of our social contract are in fact today. And we've really got to think about what is happening to our society if this continues to be the case. And I think it lies at the root of many of the popular protests that we're seeing that are anti-globalization movements, protectionist movements, xenophobic isolationist movements, 
the is economic discontent, the cultural pessimism, the anti-politic sentiment that now is the result uh, of uh, what is happening. But take the first principle, uh, the first building block, if you like. Wages are not enough for millions of people in this country to take over decent incomes, to keep their children out of poverty. I've just seen the figures. Even after the budget, even after this universal credit uh, allocation that was made in the budget, there are three million working families who will lose substantially through the introduction of universal credit. Now, these are working families, many of them on the minimum wage, who relied on the tax credits that we introduced now to become universal credit to take them out of poverty because the wage was not itself enough for them to be able to keep their family uh, in the uh, goods and the necessities of life that they ought to have. And now we are tolerating a situation where two-thirds of the children who are in poverty in this country are in families where someone is working. And so no matter how many hours some of these people are working, they cannot keep their children out of poverty. And that is a breakdown of the social contract. And it's no good the government saying that the purpose of universal credit is to help people get into work. When they get into work under universal credit, they are still in poverty because the credit is being taken away. The tax credit is being taken away under universal credit. And it's an absolute scandal that three million of our fellow citizens, their families, that's really eight or nine million people in this country, are going to suffer a million of them losses of more than 50 pounds a week, 50 pounds a week by taking away their tax credits as a result of universal credit. And it is an absolute uh, uh, outrage that this is being allowed to happen. And I hope that all of you will see the inequity uh, of freezing child benefits uh, of at the same time freezing the children's tax, the children's credit allowances and the work allowances and doing that for year after year after year while having tax uh, cuts uh, for people at the top and tax allowances raised uh, for people that are spread right across the income spectrum, helping the very rich more than anybody else. So the second pillar, the second pillar, the second pillar, the second pillar of our social contract is the ladder of opportunity. And I do fear, despite the huge contribution that Huddersfield University and many other universities make, despite the uh, uh, huge uh, commitment that we have uh, to second chances in education, that this, the rungs of this ladder are now being uh, broken. You see, in the 1950s, the evidence, and this is right across the West now, is that 80% to 90% of the children of uh, their fathers and mothers did better than their fathers and mothers. Uh, they rose uh, either in terms of their professional uh, status, uh, uh, working occupational status, uh, or in terms of their incomes and earnings. Now the figure for people born in the 1980s and 1990s is less than 50% are doing better than their parents' generation. And you can go into all the figures about who gets into university, who gets into college, but you've also got to look at earnings and who actually gets the earnings, and you will find that these ladders of opportunity do not exist in the way that they should uh, in a society that ought to be mobile and allow people who work hard and are prepared to make the effort uh, to get the chances uh, that I believe uh, they should have. And then this issue of top pay. And I'm absolutely shocked. Why is it that in the 1980s, uh, people at the top of British business, and I'm talking about American and Western businesses more generally, felt that their merit and their effort and their contribution to the community justified them having 20 times the salary of the average employee? Because that was the figure in the 1970s and 80s, 20 times. Huge difference. But that was the justification, that they were working hard, they showed effort, they were uh, entrepreneurial, everything else. But why is it that suddenly the need at the top is to have a ratio that is not 20 times the average income, but 120 times? And that is what has happened in the last 30 and 40 years. And that is something that you've got to deal with, both in terms of the original earnings and the justification for that in the boardrooms, but you've also got to deal with it through the tax system, and that's why we raised the top rate of uh, tax, uh, and that's why we uh, we, we clamped down very heavily on tax havens and tax avoidance mechanisms at the time. But you cannot have social harmony if you, in the 1980s, were prepared to justify 20 times uh, the, the size of the average income 
But now, somehow in 2018, are you working harder? Uh, have you got more merit than you had then? Is your need greater? What, what is the effort? Is the contribution to the community good? Not at all. It is just because they could get away with it. And that is something that is wrong and something that is causing the social contract to break down. And then you come to poverty, and it's not just poverty itself where the national minimum uh, is, uh, is affected by uh, the failure to keep children out of poverty. And as I say, we've got the highest figure now, uh, higher than at any time in the Thatcher major years, and I'm shocked that a government that says it wants to deal with burning injustices is a government that has actually lit the fire uh, and is actually causing uh, the poverty uh, in our midst to rise. But it's also the public services, and I think we've got to be realistic about this, that the health service, our education <laughs> services, our public services are not properly financed. Now, I, I did not win the argument, and I'll be honest about this. I tried to persuade people in 2008 and 2009, uh, I tried to persuade people that we had a financial crisis, that the only way to get out of that and is to run a deficit for the first uh, year or two so that we can actually grow the economy through the public support that was necessary, and then through growth, the deficit would come down. And I failed in my argument. We lost the election. We had a period of austerity. And of course, what happened is that public expenditure was, uh, was cut, uh, but growth did not return to the economy in any substantial amount. In fact, we went back into recession in 2011. And then, of course, we have a situation where because we've got limited growth, <coughs> Uh, we've still got high levels of debt. I mean, it's obvious, you know, if you've got an economy going well, you get tax revenues in, you don't have to pay social security benefits to the unemployed, and therefore uh, you can get your deficit down. If the economy is running badly and you want to inject growth into the economy, you've got to accept that there's a period for deficits so that you can actually uh, get growth back in, and that's because you've got less tax revenues, and of course you've got more social security payments when you've got unemployment. But I did not win that argument, but it's got to be refought again and again because we cannot allow a situation to develop where now we are underfunding our public services massively and the promise that was made in the 1940s and repeated by successive governments that the National Health Service would be properly financed and education would be properly financed, this promise is not being met. Now we can have an argument about economic policy, we can have an argument about productivity, we can have an argument about tax levels and everything else, but surely it's obvious to most people that in a civilized society, if the social contract breaks down, if you don't reward work properly, if you don't have ladders of opportunity, if you allow top pay to get out of control and create a sense of unfairness and injustice, and if you allow poverty to rise and your public services uh, to be starved of resources, then you will have a problem, a reaction in your society that will help those people who are on the extremes. Now, when I was young, I read this uh, book, uh, Clockwork Orange, and I saw the film Clockwork Orange, and I happened to meet Anthony Burgess, the author of Clockwork Orange, and many, many of you may remember the film. And it's a story, of course, for those who haven't read it, of, of a young man in, 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 uh, in Britain who's a, a thug, basically, a vandal, who's uh, a delinquent, who gets into huge amounts of trouble, uh, who uh, is in trouble with the law, uh, who is uh, uh, really a danger uh, to society. Uh, and if you watch the film Top of Orange, it is about uh, a cycle of violence that seems never ending and never comes and never actually comes, comes to an end. When Anthony Burgess wrote the book, he wrote uh, 21 chapters. And the book was a success in Britain, and it was bought by a publisher in America. And when it was bought by the publisher in America, the publisher said, I actually, I like the first 20 chapters, but I don't like chapter 21. And Anthony Burgess was short of money. He was a budding author, but had no money at the time. And the American publisher offered him to publish it, uh, but only on condition it was chapters 1 to 20 and not chapters 21. And the film, Cock of Orange, was built around chapters 1 to 20. And the result of that was, of course, uh, this endless cycle of violence. And Anthony Burgess came to hate what he'd done, and he tried to reverse it, and he couldn't do it. Because of course, chapter 21 was a completely different story ending, that this young man who was trapped in this cycle of violence, who was in this despairing cycle, uh, which seemed never ending, uh, where nothing was ever going to go right. But chapter 21 was actually redemption. The young man, about to have a kid of his own, seeing the error of his ways, turning from crime, 
becoming someone who was a decent citizen or about to be uh, as a result of realizing that he made terrible mistakes during his life. But throughout his whole life, Anthony Burgess, the author, could not throw off this idea that what he was actually glorying was violence and not an antidote to violence, which was chapter 21. And I somehow think that we're still in chapters 1 to 20. Uh, that we're in an endless cycle of uh, despair at the moment about the future of our country. I, I do feel uh, that most sections of our society are going to start to feel that we're not only divided, but they've been let down. If you're a Remainer, you feel you've been let down because you feel the re referendum was corrupt and the electoral practices, as confirmed by the Electoral Commission. If you're a Lever, you feel this was the one chance you had people saying, listen to me, and yet, you now find it's all the Westminster games and the Westminster bubble over again, party squabbles, and nothing actually uh, positive seems to be coming from the promises and more for the health service and everything else, people feeling betrayed. And I do feel that we've got to do something about it. We've got to say to each other that Britain is better than this. We are better than the divisions that seem to dominate our society at the moment. We are better than what seems to be a loss of trust, a breakdown of trust in our society. And we are better uh, than simply throwing, us, throwing allegations of betrayal at each other and saying that someone else is to blame for everything that's going wrong. I do think we've got to rebuild the social contract. I do think we've got to think what kind of society we want for the future. I don't think a society that makes up its mind that it can use its wealth effectively to help those who are in the most difficulty is a society that puts its economy at risk at all. I think we understand that too much inequality is a barrier to economic success and not the key to economic success. But I think we've now got to have a national conversation about where we're going, how we can end the disunity that now exists in the country, how we can rebuild uh, ourselves as a country that is no longer as divided as we are today. But the starting point, I think, is to learn lessons from Harold Wilson's life, that your priorities, no matter how uh, important economic objectives are, the priorities of an, an economy that is successful is not simply that the successful run away with all the, the gains, but we actually have a social conscience that allows us uh, to benefit those people who are most in need. So if I take lessons from Harold Wilson's life, when well, he wrote Purpose in Politics, purpose in politics is to ensure that every person has the best possible chance in life and we do our best to help people bridge the gap between what they are and what they have in themselves to become. The starting point of that is education, but it does demand policies for social justice. And I hope I've made that point to you this evening. Thank you very much. <coughs>